morning, everybody. Good morning. There's just a few of us here right now, huh? Kind of not many for a typical Tuesday. Okay, let me see. Let me get us set up. So I finished, you may have already noticed that I finished grading lab seven, eight, and nine. Uh, and I'm just gonna, because it's 1030, I'm gonna go ahead and start talking about that. And uh, if people, if folks miss it, they're just gonna have to watch the recording to find out, I suppose. Because I don't, I don't really have time to lose today. We have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, I want to get to coastlines. Um, I have a nice um, set of slides for you on coastlines. I think that you'll enjoy. Learn some things. We'll talk about waves and riptides and things that are useful, ways that you can recognize those in, at the beach and so that you can avoid them. Uh, okay, so the labs. I, okay, so for the mineral labs, I gave you each individualized, detailed feedback. And it took forever, forever. And I started doing the same thing on, on lab eight for the igneous and metamorphic rocks. But it was, I get, you know, I try to just give you a, just a few notes, just a few things. I just want to say this. I just want to say that. And then I end up writing a lot because I'm trying to explain to you like a certain concept or why the way that you did it is not quite right. And, you know, I want to set you straight so that you guys learn from your mistakes. That's, that's an important part of of college, right? Is it's not just what you get right, it's what you get wrong and how you fix it too. So um, I want you to understand the process for identifying minerals a little bit better uh, for, well, I'm getting off track. Okay, let me, I'll talk about the labs in a second. But I, what I wanted to say is I just, I could not do the same thing for lab eight with the rocks because it, I was never going to be able to write the exam in, at this rate. So I had to stop doing that. And um, I am going to put, I'm going to put a few more, like a slightly more detailed key for each of those labs, not lab nine, because there, there really, there isn't one. Um, but I'm going to put more detailed keys for labs seven and eight that will help you to study from them. Because when you get your labs back, I want you to read my feedback, please. Um, and then go look at what you did and compare what I said about your lab to the correct answers. One thing that, so I hope that you do that and that you take those steps and try to understand where you went wrong on the labs because you're going to see similar questions on the exam. Um, you know, we I, I lectured to you a lot about rocks and minerals and you know, in sedimentary environments and all that stuff over the last few weeks that this exam is going to cover. And I still haven't written it. Honestly, this is that's my next thing that I've got to do. I'm running late and I put a note on iLearn about me running late. I hope to have the exam written later today, like late, late, late. It's probably gonna take me the rest of the day to finish that off. So it, it'll be open when it's done and ready. But when I'm writing the lab, I consider what I talked about in the lecture what I highlighted as being important, you know, there frequently I'll stop on a slide, maybe not frequently, but sometimes I stop on a slide and I say, okay, this is a really important concept and I want you to write this down. This is definitely a, gonna be like a test question. So those things, you know, I go back and I look at my lectures 
and I look for those things and I said, oh yeah, I need to have a question about that or maybe a few questions about that and I write them different ways. So that's what you should do. You should go back and look at the lecture slides. Um, listen to me explain anything that wasn't clear to you the first time, listen to it again. You may need to read about it in your textbook. If it's not, if my explanation isn't doing it for you, try looking to your textbook. And I realize, you know, I've been teaching for a while and I know that there are a lot of you out there aren't reading the textbook or like barely cracking it. Some of you are doing doing it and that is fantastic because I think that will it it definitely supplements and complements what I do in the lecture. And there are a few a few topics that they cover in the the textbook that um, I never talk about in the lecture, but they're fair game on the exam. Um, if they're important enough to show up on the quizzes, the online quizzes for the textbook reading, then it's it's certainly a fair game topic for an exam question. Okay, so the online quizzes is another place to look for a typical exam type question that I might give you. Um, but I also then go to the labs and I look at what I asked you to do in the labs. You saw in the first exam that I had you, I gave you like an image, like something, a diagram ex that showed something and I asked you to interpret it, to explain it, whatever. I encourage you to sketch out answer, if they're short answers, to sketch something. It doesn't have to be just a written explanation, right? Sketch it, label it, point to things, and then write your explanation that incorporates your sketch. It's so valuable um, for, for you. And you know, I can really see how well you understand a concept if you try to sketch it. Okay, but um, back to the lab question. So I, you know, what kinds of questions might I ask you about identifying rocks and minerals that would show up on the exam? That type of question, um, I would expect that you would need to be given a couple of things. If I were to say, here's a rock, look at it. Um, you know, I may or may not have like virtual testing things. It might just be like, here's a rock, tell me about it. Uh, and you do your best. Some rocks would be really tricky like that. And I'm gonna avoid those. For example, um, a rhyolite, so a volcanic rock that's sort of tannish, a sandstone, that's kind of tannish, and a quartzite, that's kind of tannish, that's a metamorphic rock, and maybe a tough, you know, a pyroclastic rock, an explosive volcanic eruption. Those things could all be sort of like fine grained in general, um, all one color, blah, what are you gonna do? You can't identify that online, there's no way, not without a lot more information. So I'm not gonna do that to you. If I gave you a rock to or a mineral to identify, it would have that image would have to show give you enough information that you should be able to interpret it and then um, identify it. For example, and maybe I give you like an identification table that helps you to name the rock so that you don't have to memorize the rock names, but you could follow a chart that said, all right, that you need, you, you got to pick if it's sedimentary, metamorphic, or igneous of some kind. And igneous, remember, is either plutonic or volcanic, or it could be like a pyroclastic rock, I suppose. But um, so you need to like break it down and tell me what kind to start. And then if you had an identification chart, you would say, all right, I'm going to go to the igneous rocks here. And I'm going to say, all right, you've got to break it down by composition and by texture, right? So composition is like, you're gonna assess the color. How many dark minerals are in it? 
what are the constituents? Is it made up of angular rock pieces? I've got a, like a fuzz on my nose, sorry. Um, is it angular rock pieces? Is it a mixture of small grains and large grains? Is it, does it have layering of some kind? Is there compositional banding? Um, so you should be thinking of rock types when I say those things. But as long as you can follow a flow chart, then you can get to the right name. Like in your labs for, in your lab eight, for example, there were charts to help you name these rocks but they required that you had you had to assess the composition color color index right is it a really dark rock is it a really light rock or does it have dark minerals light min you know you you know what i'm saying and then you've got to assess the texture so it's composition texture texture could be in if it's an igneous rock we're talking is it fine grained is it coarse grained is it made up of like broken fragments, like an explosive eruption? Or is it glassy? Um, you know, some basic textural information and you have to pick one. So just looking at a rock, is it coarse grain? Is it fine grain? Can you see individual mineral crystals in the rock? Or no, does it kind of look all uniform grains, but you can't um, pick anything out, then it's maybe fine grained. Um, or maybe it could be like uniform grains that are very large too, but you get what I'm saying. Like, are there visible crystals or are they too small? Then, you know, it sends you to a plutonic rock naming scheme if if it's coarse grained or if it's very fine grained or maybe mixed composition like fine and coarse, then it sends you down a volcanic ex you know, line of thinking, line of naming. And then it would go by composition. Is it felsic, intermediate, mafic, ultramafic, something like that. And then you would say, okay, well, this is mafic clearly because it's like really dark gray or black depending on your view. Um, and then that takes you over to basalt. Or if it's if it's a porphyritic texture, if it has the mixed large and small crystals, then maybe you would say it was um, an olivine basalt or a porphyritic, I guess, porphyritic basalt, something like that. Uh, so you're gonna need to be able to make those basic distinctions in the rocks to be able to follow those charts and then name the rocks. Now, you maybe remember the rock names. For example, maybe you know that a felsic plutonic rock is a granite or that a felsic volcanic rock is a rhyolite, those kinds of names. Um, maybe you already know that obsidian is felsic, just like granite and rhyolite, even though it's black. That's the one exception to the our color index rule, really. <clears throat> maybe I'll I'll show I'll run you through a couple of those charts just to make sure that you see them first. They were in your lab, but I will open up the lab and share that with you. Why don't I just do that right now? Wait, which one did I? Sorry, I'm looking at the edit dates to see if the key is the most recent or if it's the original. Okay. Let me just find, okay, it's definitely not the key. I only had the table in the key, not the whole thing. Let me get this going. Come on, open up. Almost there, guys. Okay. Oh, it's in the chat. How much time? Um, 
I'm probably going to make it just like the last exam. I'll try to write an exam to take an hour or less, um, but I'll give you double that time. So to at least two hours to take the exam. Uh, I'm not going to write anything that I think will take you more than an hour, but I want to make sure that I don't want you guys to feel time pressure, right? If if you, you know, I frequently let students stay beyond staying in class and keep working on an exam if they have time after a class. Uh, and that's totally possible. If you think you need more time, like if you felt any kind of pressure on the first exam, please let me know, email me and ask for more time and I will happily give you extra time. But, there's a downside to the extra time. You could ask, you were like, oh, I would love extra time because then I could like flip through the labs and check my answers and do all that. You can also spend inordinate amounts of time doing, looking up answers and you'll never get anywhere. You'll, you'll get halfway through the exam and still need more hours because you've spent so much time looking up your, doing research on the questions. And that tells me you know how to do research. It doesn't tell me if you've learned the material. So that's the downside. So I don't wanna give you like forever for that reason. But as long as it's like a reasonable request, I don't mind giving a little bit of extra time, okay? But if you don't need it, just take the exam. And because it's double time, you've got time to like look through things, hopefully. And I would, you know, before you start the exam, I would um, get everything together, like have the textbook open on a, the screen somewhere and maybe hidden behind something else and maybe a printout of your lab or have your labs open on the screen so that you can flip through those. I know that, that, you know, this is an open book exam and I'm writing it that way, knowing that because, um, because, and so I ask you to do more thinking. I hope that I'm writing questions that make you think through the answer instead of some just looking it up because it's definitely not a memorization sort of exam. Okay. Okay, so these are the tables I was talking about. Um, and these were on that website. I think I need to zoom in here a little bit better. You tell me if you guys, I think I'll put, this should be big enough. Let me just get it. What is that? It's not the window I wanted. Okay. Can you read that? Yes. Yes. Good, thank you. Okay, so here is a, uh, one of these classification tables. So if I ask you, I keep saying this, like if I ask you to identify minerals or rocks for the exam, I would give you a, a, a table, a classification table like this to help you name the rocks. You still need to be able to identify the texture and the composition, right? That's on you. But I would give you this, and if you can follow this, then you don't have to memorize the rock names. Um, that's a, a gift to you. Not, not, not every professor teaching physical geology would do that. But um, I want you to learn how to apply what you know, not memorize a bunch of terms. So that I'm asking you to do a slightly different kind of learning, hopefully. Okay. Um, I'm telling, there will be questions like this on the exam, I promise. I don't know how many it's not going to dominate the exam. It would be like a few. Uh, I, I don't want your exam to be a test of your ability to identify rocks and minerals. Um, it's much more than that. So I can't imagine, to just quantify it for you, I can't imagine the rock and mineral identification to be more than a third of the exam. I think that's on the high end. I was gonna say a quarter, but I wanted to leave myself a little wiggle room. So I don't think I'm gonna, not more than a third of the exam. So two thirds will be on like lecture type stuff, reading type 
material. Okay, and, and concepts from the, the labs, just not identification. <clears throat> so if you've got questions about that, please um, ask. But anyway, okay, so here we are. This is for igneous rocks. So this can be, um, this is for crystalline, meaning you they have crystals in them, but they're, you have to decide whether they're coarse grained and know that phaneritic means coarse grained. If you have a printer or if you have the ability, you can like write notes in a pencil in Adobe Acrobat or something. Maybe you can write on here. If you don't already know that phaneritic means coarse grained, then I would just write it, no, coarse grained there. And that affinitic is fine grained so that you don't have to look it up later, right? This would be a good thing to have like ready by your side. And that porphyritic means a mixture of fine grained, it's like a fine grained mix, matrix and a coarse grained crystals in, in it. Uh, and then you would follow down here. Okay, so it would be like phaneritic. That means large crystals. And that, that's what that tells you. I guess you don't have to write it down because it says that microscopic size crystals for affinitic. Macroscopic means you can see with your naked eye. And then compositions down here. So decreasing silica from felsic to ultramafic. And so this is where, can you identify any minerals in the rock? And when I asked you that on the lab, people still answered like that they could, I, they guessed some minerals for rhyolite and for basalt, even though they were fine grained volcanic rocks and all it was was like uniform tan or uniform black rock. Um, you can't identify minerals. So I was surprised to see that people answered that. I think what you were telling me was, I expect to find these minerals in this rock, but you couldn't see them. I was just asking you to tell me what you could see. So that's what I mean. That's what I meant also by that question on the lab. Okay, so you can identify minerals here. You have to go with just the color index, right? Is it pale gray or really dark? brownish orange or something like that you call it andesite or is it dark black or dark gray call it a basalt or if it's pink or purple or pale tan color then rhyolite rhyolites felsic um, if it's porphyritic you have maybe a little bit of evidence in addition to just the color index of the matrix that might be tan or gray or whatever you have the information from the phenocris, those crystals that are in that fine grain ma matrix. Remember, I remember I gave you this tip when we were doing this in the lecture. I said, this is one of the slides in the lecture. I said, if it's a sort of intermediate matrix color, like light gray, maybe dark gray. So you're leaning towards intermediate, maybe not felsic but then the crystals in it are like white feldspars, like little white rectangles. I would lean, you know, lean towards the, the felsic or intermediate side. Don't go mafic because of those light crystals. But if it were the same rock and it had black crystals in it that might have been amphiboles or pyroxenes, um, then I would go towards the mafic side or the more andesitic. So that's how I, the additional information that you have that I want you to apply to the composition. If it, you know, color index plus any information from the minerals that you can see, light colored, dark colored. That one. Okay. Or is it a vesicular texture? It has those um, preserved bubbles in it, right? Uh, you had a couple of rocks in your lab that were, I see that I'm talking a long time about this, I'm gonna, but I want you to like get ready for the exam and um, not all the labs were so great. So I wanna make sure you guys are set straight on a few things. Uh, you had a vesicular basalt and that a lot of people called scoria. 
that's a common name for that rock. I was actually looking for vesicular basalt, but I accepted scoria because I know it's a common name. But I'm afraid that people didn't actually identify that as mafic. They just said, oh, scoria, but you know, what is it? It's a basalt. Um, and oftentimes scoria will look red. You'll have like a vesicular red rock. People have it in their front yards, like in the sidewalk strip a lot of times. They'll either have like a white rock, which is usually dolomite, uh, um, a metamorphic, metamorpho sedimentary rock, or um, they'll have that like red bubbly, the vesicular um, basalt or scoria in their yard. Okay, so um, if it's vesicular, those are your two choices. You have a felsic option, which is pumice. And that's correct. Pumice is always felsic, just like obsidian. Um, or you have uh, a basalt scoria. Th th this is like the same. I wouldn't use scoria though. I think the vesicular basalt is more appropriate for this class, but no biggie, right? Okay, fragmental. Well, let me skip down to glassy. So this is glass. Pumice is glass. Um, this vesicular basalt, it's just, it's basalt. I wanna make sure that you understand that pumice is glass, obsidian is glass. They don't have any minerals in them. There is no structure to the rock. It's just glass. Uh, it has the same comp chemical composition, but um, it doesn't have the minerals in it. So you can't identify minerals usually. Like sometimes you'll see phenocris or something, or or even they're called microlites, little tiny, tiny crystals that may have found their way into the glass, but usually there's nothing there, just glass. And they're both felsic, pumice and obsidian are felsic. This, say, this is showing like this extends into the intermediate side, but whatever. This is always black, Ugh, except for when it's red. <laughs> and sometimes it might look a little white if it's starting to get, if it's got a little gas in it, a little gassy, starts to become pumicey. So um, expect black, expect red, expect maybe little white bands or something like that in obsidian. Pumice, um, I've seen it light gray to dark gray. And bas vesicular basalt looks black to red. The, the iron... Anytime you see red, it's telling you that iron had oxidized on, on it somewhere. And so if you've got an oxidized vesicular rock, it's telling you it's iron rich. So you should guess mafic. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, okay. There's another question. For confirmation, is obsidian always felsic? Yes, obsidian, it, yes, it's got a, a rhyolitic composition, but I say rhyolitic just because it's like a rhyolite. It's not, it's not actually a rhyolite, it's all glass. Rhyolite has crystals in it, actual, they're just very small crystals. And, and right, like these are all products of lava flows, right? Same, same here, oftentimes these are flows. Occasionally you'll have like lapilli or small blocks and bombs of pumice or basalt come out. So they could be pyroclastic. Um, so, you know, if you went pyroclastic to explain it, that would be okay. If you went like lava flow, that would be okay. The fragmental, so, and glassy is always, obsidian is always a, a flow. A fragmental texture though is telling you that it is explosive eruption, right? So it's pyroclastic, it's not a lava flow. Um, and when you see the pyroclastic rocks, they get they, they are often either called a tuff or a breccia. Now a breccia, a, a lot of people identified what they said were volcanic breccias on the lab and those, Particles that were in the, the fragments were, I think, too small to call a breccia. I would simply call it a, a tough 
I would give it a name lithic tuff because it's got rock fragments in it. I, I think I understand where you come from calling it a, a breccia. And that's cool because you're, they're angular pieces, but beware that those are supposed you typically larger pieces. You can still have fragments of volcanic rock in a tuff. Like there might be pumice lapilli or other fragments in it that tell you it's a tuff also, and that it's not, um, you know, this might look uniformly kind of tan. So to compare a, ry a, a, a rhyolite that's not porphyritic, a rhyolite to a tuff could be really, diff sorry, really difficult. So I'm not gonna do that to you. If you have a tuff on the lab, I'm going to give you one that has obvious different rock fragments. So not all the same crystal that would be more like a porphyritic type, type volcanic rock versus a, a rock with fragments in it that tells you it was an explosive eruption and that those fragments are all kind of different pieces. It's not just one composition. It's not like all crystals of one kind. If it were all crystals of one kind, I think you'd be looking at a porphyritic rock. So you need to distinguish the tufts from the flows by looking for evidence that it was an explosive eruption, angular particles, pumice lapilli, meaning pumice pieces in there, um, different rock fragments, so different colored rocks, not just crystals. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna stop there. But I'm gonna try to give you ones that are clearly one or the other. I'm not gonna give you tricky ones. I'm gonna take it easy. Okay, enough on those. Um, metamorphic rocks. Um, you had, I'm gonna shrink this a little bit so we can see more and hopefully be able to see still. Okay, so we've got um, the, the foliated metamorphics, metamorphic rocks here that start with a slate. So we're talking a shale protolith, start with a slate, the really fine layering, the phyllite that has the sheen, but you don't see the big micas yet, the big muscovites or biotites or whatever. A schist has the visible micas. And then the gneiss has visible dark light bands or different color bands. I told you some, I've seen ones with green and red bands. Same thing, if you see that banding, it's a nice. So um, you did have one of each, a, a schist and a nice on the exam. And the nice was full of biotite that was so obvious. And a lot of people called it a schist, I think because of all that biotite mica. And I said, like, if there's visible micas, you should call it a schist. Except that, that rock also had fantastic compositional banding. It was like light quartz and feldspar layers and black biotite layers. It was an, I was, I would call it a nice, like a biotite nice. That's the proper name because of the banding. If it were really finely layered mica, it fi sorry, fine micaceous layers without that compositional banding, so lacking that compositional banding, then I would go with the schist name. So compositional banding, go with nice. Layers defined by visible micas, or sorry, um, biotite or muscovite would be a schist. A phyllite would, it looks a lot like a slate, right? Except it's got a sheen to it that tells you that the micas are starting to grow. You're seeing the reflection off the cleavage faces of those tiny mica crystals. And slate is low enough grade, the minerals are still clay type minerals. They haven't transformed the clay minerals to the micas yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then you had quartzite and marble were your typical sort of uniform, they were non-foliated you know, like large crystal rock that you differentiated based on like this one fizzed because it's calcium carbonate and this one didn't. 
that was one way you told the difference. Okay. And this helps with protolith. Yeah, that, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that there. There was a little bit of confusion, but understand like limestone transforms to marble, both of them fizz. So that should make sense to you. They're both made out of calcium carbonate. Um, the difference between a quartz sandstone and a quartzite is what? Do you know? In a quartz sandstone, you, you ought to be able to see what looks like beach sand, like little rounded crystals in it. A quartzite, all of those crystals should have grown together and they're now forming interlocking large quartz crystals. So it won't look like a beach sand anymore. It'll, it'll look, but it'll, it'll like have sort of a glassy sheen to it. It might even have like conchoidal fracture, you know, like quartz. Okay, uh, I'll stop there. Oh, maybe I'll just point a couple, just a couple last things. Color index. I wasn't looking for color. I was looking for the color index here. That means I wanted either a percentage of the dark minerals. That's what technically what color index means. So you could have just listed like 50% for the diorite or gabbro um, or 10% for what was in there, a rhyolite or something. Or you could have described the tone as being sort of felsic in tone, mafic in tone. There was a description of this in the lab. Um, did I put it? I may have put it at the very beginning. No, I didn't incorporate it. It was another diagram thing. And I will... I will include that diagram if I ask you about the same kind of thing, if I ask you to give me tone, but that's what it's after. Does it look more felsic? Does it look more mafic? And you're basing that on the colors. And it said like pinks, purples, um, light orange are more felsic. Dark orange, dark yellow green, more intermediate, and then really dark green and black, dark gray is mafic. So it had that kind of rainbow and it was kind of showing you. And that's because volcanic rocks, oftentimes felsic volcanic rocks come in a variety of pretty, pretty colors actually. Um, there's a famous place in China they call it like the rainbow hills or something um and it's all i think it it's a vol it's a a volcanic terrain and so they have all these different beds of really brightly colored volcanic rocks and so reds and greens and pinks and purples and when the light's just right it's gorgeous <clears throat> it's some kind of trace element in there that is giving those volcanic rocks that color in particular. Um, you just need to recognize that the pinks and the purples go with felsic. I think you have the idea that light tan or very pale gray might be um, felsic already. Okay. Composition of the phenocris. If the rock didn't have phenocris, then don't identify any phenocris. So it should have this would have been answered only if you had a, 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 a porphyritic rock, right? One with a mixed, a mixed texture. So it had fine crystals and large crystals in the same rock. So I was, and I was really just asking you to tell me, are they dark or are they light colored crystals? I wasn't asking you to try to identify the mineral either. So again, when you identified minerals, I assume you just like put minerals down you thought should be in the rock based on its color index, I guess. Identify any recognizable minerals. So like AO1, it was a really green rock. 
it was olivine that made up more than 90% of it actually. Even though when you look at the rock, it's got like a pale part of it that you could maybe talk yourself into being quartz, except I told you one time, only one time though, quartz and olivine never grow together, ever. They don't grow in equilibrium together. It doesn't chemically, it doesn't work. Um, and that makes sense because quartz is down here on the felsic end, olivine's down here on the mafic or ultra mafic end. You don't find quartz in the mantle. You do find lots of olivine. So those never go together. So that was all olivine. It just like was a paler green, I think. Anyway, so guessing, people did guess olivine, but they guessed some other stuff too. I, I just don't know what you base, I, like don't try so hard to identify the minerals. Like if you see something, you're like, oh, there's a green mineral there, then go ahead and guess the green mineral, but don't be like, oh, if I squint really hard, I think I see something else. Mm. Don't, don't do it like that. Just the obvious stuff. And so if you saw like uh, the nice, for example, it would be great if you guessed quartz and feldspar for the light bands and biotite or hornblende or both for the dark bands. That'd be fantastic. Okay, crystalline or fragmental glassy vesicular. We talked about those textures, right? Oftentimes glassy and vesicular go together like with the pumice. So don't be afraid to put down a couple terms if they apply. Um, is it affinitic, phanaritic, or porphyritic? If your rock is glassy, these terms really don't apply because this talks about the crystallinity. This is telling you about the size of the crystals and glassy rocks don't have crystals. So that, that's what I, was, I mean. Volcanic, you guys know that pyroclastic is a volcanic process but pyroclastic is being specific to an explosive eruption. So we're looking for the ash, we're looking for like the mixture of angular particles and pumice lapilli in an ash matrix and we call it a tuff. So it's not a peaceful lava flow. And I'm using, or we're using volcanic here as being more like it's a, a volcanic lava flow, a non-explosive eruption. Okay. Um, foliated or non-foliated. Uh, some people, okay, so if you see any planar elements in the metamorphic rocks I give you, that's a foliation, okay? any plane, whether it's the top or the bottom or something in the middle, if you see a planar element, go ahead and call that a foliation. If it's a sedimentary rock, it's a bed. Okay, I'm gonna leave this alone. I want you guys to uh, go and look at the keys. I'm gonna update, add a few more details to the keys right after class and I'll update the ones that are there already. Study those, compare those. Okay, ah, I took a really long time. Are there questions about that? You also had a video. You also had um, the Understanding Volcanic Hazards video. I hope that went well. I saw that you had scores already and it seemed to go pretty well. Um, hopefully you took notes so that um, you could answer the questions pretty easily. Big grumpy. Okay, I'm gonna leave that there. <clears throat> All right, hopefully, um, so I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Anything about those labs, any of them? Um, I'm talking minerals, rocks, sedimentary processes, that one. So, um, I think it was just the one video, right? In this, for exam one, you've only seen one video. You saw the understanding volcanic hazards. Right, because the video for vi the earthquake stuff was for the last exam thing. And then the coast, the beach, a river of sand, that video, that's for the, the final exam. That's for the stuff I'm gonna start talking about today. 
Okay, so the exam covers stuff through last week. I'm gonna be here on Friday. Uh, I think that I'll be here for the whole two hours. Let me just double check. Yes, I'll be here for the whole two hours on Friday. So 11 to one. If you can make it, and if you've had time to like look through your labs and come and ask me questions, that's a great time to use, like I'm available to ask questions of to get ready for the exam. So if you can do a little pre preparation before Friday, then uh, ask away and that might help you out. Okay, you guys are being quiet today. Really no questions? I have a question, but it's not related to the exam. All right, go for it. Um, I noticed, I remember you were talking about MinPet 1 being offered in the spring, but I it, noticed that it's it's still not up on the schedule. I know. Okay. So if, um, if anybody <laughs> like, oh yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I have one more th thing, to say, thing to say about your labs after this. It is going to be offered I hope, because um, there's we still have to get the the last the final approval from the provost. The provost is basically the president, the university president's right hand woman, um, and when she approves it, and I think she's waiting to because it it's offered. It's the only course in the entire College of Science and Engineering that is gonna be offered in person at all. I couldn't believe that when I heard that. Um, so I managed, so far I got through all the levels except for the provost approving my plan to meet for two hours in person on campus so that, that students in the, my mineralogy and petrology class can um, study rocks and minerals uh, on the microscope or in hand specimen. I hope it will be finalized soon and that it will show up on the schedule, but I gave you the times for it, right? Yes. Okay, um, that's the plan. I don't know if we will meet Thursday or Friday on campus in person, that kind of depends. Um, I'll, I'll let you know that too, but um, I'm gonna advertise it as soon as it's out, as soon as I know there's a small chance she might not approve it. And I'm, you know, I'm really crossing my fingers that, you know, London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco just cracked down on a bunch of businesses and the university has been going the conservative route kind of with as far as COVID restrictions goes. And San Francisco and the university have been similar. So I'm really hoping that the provost does not like crack down and say, all right, no, no in-person classes again. I'm hoping for the university to start opening up. So I can't promise, but it's looking good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just, no, they, it's okay. They, they're waiting doing so everything you can. Yeah, they're they're waiting so long to do all these approvals. It's ridiculous. They okay. did the same thing for fall classes. They didn't they didn't tell people like what was happening for sure until like the week before classes started. And um, yeah, so they haven't been good. Okay. Um, if there's anyone else in this class who's enjoying this class, who likes maybe even looking at rocks and minerals, you don't have to like looking at rocks and minerals if you're enjoying the other stuff. I encourage you to explore the earth science, earth and climate sciences major um, we're a small department. You always get in our classes. You get one-on-one -on -one advising with a faculty member every semester. So to keep you on track towards graduation, we help plan all of your classes out through graduation so that you, you know what's going to happen. And, you know, our students are getting jobs is when they graduate. There are companies all throughout the Bay Area with our graduates working in them like private companies that do like the geotechnical geology, like anytime there's construction in the Bay Area, which is happening all the time, or any changes to a building get made, 
they need geologists to come in and check out the ground. And so that's an, a good starting position for a geology major and their jobs all over the place. And that's not just the only kind, like we have students who end up getting jobs at the US Geological Survey. And um, I had one working on volcanoes, uh, not active ones, old, ancient volcanoes out in the, the Basin and Range province and Nevada and a lot of other really cool experiences. Travel is like a, a big part of, of geology. So we have classes with lots of field trips and classes with lots of labs. So you get hands-on experience. I know a lot of you already have your ma majors declared, but a lot of you are also still freshmen and sophomores and you don't have to stick with that plan if you don't want to. You can switch, it's totally possible. So I encourage you to think about that or come talk to me more if you're, you're curious, okay? I hope you're enjoying this. I hope everybody's enjoying the class, even if you had a, a couple of bad lab scores or something. And that's the other thing I wanted to just say before we go on to the lecture. I've been grading kind of tough and I know that. Um, it's based on a rubric. Like I, I take the lab and I'm like, all right, this is how much I'm gonna give a half point to each of these and a one point to each of those. And when I go through very carefully and I check correct answers against incorrect answers, oftentimes, you know, it, it nickels and dimes you to death and it, it brings your grade down. But I can't, I can't keep doing this detailed grading. I just can't. So with lab eight, I started a new process. I'm still using a rubric, but I'm not counting every single point. I'm kind of averaging what it, how you did. So I'm looking to see on average, have you answered these correctly? Does it seem like you're getting the answers right? Are you give you know, giving me a volcanic name and using vol like the terms to describe the texture of a volcanic rock. You know, if it's a dark rock, have you given me an, a, a name that's vaguely, it's mafic or ultra mafic, that kind of thing. And then I'm giving you sort of like a, a close score and your scores went up for lab eight. And lab nine was easy because that was just certificates of completion. And I offered that if you gave me your notes that you took while you were doing the lab, I would bump your scores up. So everybody, a lot of people got a bump up. Everybody got a bump up on that, that lab. And I hope that the combination of slightly higher scores on lab eight, higher scores on lab nine, I'm going to take it easy on the labs from here on out. You've done a lot of work on the labs. You did a great job. It's going to get easier now. And I'm going to start grading easier now. So you can sigh a little sigh of relief, like breathe a little sigh of relief. And um, your lab scores, your the averages should start coming up. And that's going to have an effect on your grade. So make sure you turn in, you do these last labs. I think that you'll, that'll help with your grade because it's 60% of your score overall. Okay, really no questions about anything? I'm gonna start with um, coastlines today. I have one quick question. Yeah, go for it. I just missed the part where you um, explained um, um, the timeline for exam two. So um, how much time do we have for exam two? Like um, with two hours. Start? Two hours. Okay. And when does it start again? Like what, what date? I'm going to have it late today. Okay. And it's open till next Monday at noon. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, I would also like to get your opinion Remember how last week I tried something a little bit different and I included like quiz type questions in the lecture slides. Uh, did you guys like that? Was that useful to you? Could I get um, some thumbs up, some thumbs down, some liked it or like some indication? Oh, a heart even. Okay. So can, 
so was that because you thought it was good practice or that it was testing that you were paying attention or it woke you up from my lecture a little bit? It gave you a little break? Like what? Anything? I practice. I feel okay. like it really helped. Like it really like helped me put together what I just learned and like it helped me understand it better. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I'll put some back in. I did not include them in the first part of, we're only going to cover like half of coastlines today. It's it. I thought it was going to be a one day sort of slide adventure, but um, there's so much good stuff. I don't want to leave anything out. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I will add in more questions for Thursday. Today is going to be question like light, but I can uh, make some up like questions up on the fly maybe. Okay, so coastlines. We have a beautiful coastline. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain to you why our coastline looks like this. Does anybody have a guess? Why do we have cliffs on our coast? Florida doesn't have cliffs on their coast. Have you, has anyone been to Florida? Or been to any beaches on the East Coast? I've been to Florida. Yeah. What are the beaches like? Um, are you talking about water form or the, the ground of the sand or? Yeah, like the ground of the sand. Like, do you have to climb down steps in the cliff to get down to the beach? Um, well, it depends on which beach. I only went to one beach when I went there. Yeah. It was like, I didn't really see many. Was it Miami? Oh, I'm not even sure. It was kind of. I don't remember. I, I think it was maybe Miami. So I'm when I think of Miami beaches, I think like long stretch, a flat beach, yeah, and the yeah. buildings are like right there. Um, I think there might have been some cliffs, but far behind. Far I behind. Didn't, okay. I didn't see many buildings. Maybe I think it was near houses though. Okay. So maybe houses by the beach? Yes. And okay, right on okay. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of like a tip what I'm thinking of of a typical Florida beach. Thank you, Ashanti. Um, they're generally pretty flat, low lying. There's big high rises along Miami beach anyway. And it's almost like you could just like walk out from the lobby of the hotel and right out onto the beach and right into the water and just keep going nice and shallow. That kind of beach is really different because that's a passive margin. There's no active tectonics going on on the East Coast, is there? They don't have a plate boundary because where is the plate boundary on the east, on the Eastern side of the North American plate? Think about that for a minute. Where's the, where's the Western boundary to North America? The tectonic boundary between North, the North American plate and the Pacific plate. What's separating us here? It's not that far off the coast um, of the West Coast, right? And then there's a, yeah. a ridge between the North American and the Pacific plate. Yeah, but right? what kind is, are, do we have a spreading ridge here? Do we have a subduction zone here? Do we have a transform fault here is what I'm after. Um, a subduction zone? Here? Or there's the transform from the San Andreas. Yeah, so here we've got the, the transform fault that's the San Andreas fault. You're right that we have subduction along the western part of the North American continent, but that's between the Juan de Fuca plate and the North American plate, right? Yeah, so the, the Pacific's right behind it. It's a small plate, I know you forget about it, but it is a, diff a small different plate. Here between the North American and Pacific plate is the, the San Andreas fault. So we have a transform fault here. Before that, we had a subduction. It changed about 30 million. Well, here it changed about 10 million years ago. Um, so over time, it's been different. In fact, over geologic time, over the last couple billion years, there have been four different plate type boundaries here a Japan type boundary, a Chilean type boundary. Um, so there was an island arc here at one point offshore and it was like Chile when we had the subduction zone, kind of like Cascades now. But the east, the east coast 
um, they don't have the plate boundary right there at the between the ocean and the continent. Right. Think think back to your your plate tectonics labs. Where's the plate boundary between the North American plate and the European plate? Here, um, would, wouldn't it be in the Atlantic along the, along the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic? You got it, the mid-Atlantic ridge. Thank you for being brave enough to offer that up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so you have to go all the way out into the middle of the Atlantic to the mid-Atlantic ridge, that spreading ridge that separated, that opened up the ocean when Pangaea broke up and pushed Europe to where it is now and North America to where it is now. So the, co the tectonic plate boundary is really far from the coast. Here, our, bound our tectonic boundary is at the coast, essentially. It's either on land or offshore, depending on where you are in California. <clears throat> it's, the act it's an active tectonic boundary. We know that because we have earthquakes. It's the active tectonic boundary that gives us the, the coastal cliffs here. Um, and in this lecture, I'm gonna explain, um, I'll explain that history. <laughs> I've got a squeaky cat here. Um, that the, this history, you can see the uplift over time in the coastal cliffs. If you've ever driven down highway one, along the coast here, like maybe along the peninsula, uh, down toward from San Francisco to Santa Cruz, that sort of section, it looks like this. You're driving the highways up here and the beaches down here below some cliffs most of the time. This you're seeing is the ancient version of this. This is a wave cut platform right here. And that's what's underneath the beach sand right here is the rock, which is a pretty flat line. And it was eroded away over time by the wave action. So that 100,000 years ago, that was down here. But over time, it's been lifted up. And actually you can see four, at least four terraces old ancient marine terraces, the, uh, sorry, the wave cut platforms, they're also called terraces, um, up in the hills in the Santa Cruz mountains. They get less flat as you go up because there's there's been a lot of erosion and like weathering. So, you know, and it's like made out of beach sand. It's like sandstone. So it, it doesn't, it, it's not super strong. It's going to erode away over time. So to get more rounded, I'll show you an example. But this is the kind of thing I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about the, the waves too and how, why we have waves that look like this, why the waves are here and not out there, um, at least why we have white water here, why are the waves breaking, how to look at the, the waves and pick out where the riptides are so that when you go to the beach, you will stay away from the riptides so you don't get sucked out to sea. That is really common out here. We, If you're not from California originally and you're not, or if you haven't spent a lot of time at the beach in your life, you need to know about these riptides because they're everywhere and sometimes they can be very strong. Ocean Beach is kind of a dangerous place to swim because of the riptides. And um, you'll see people out there, but you don't see a lot. And that's probably, number one, it's cold water. And I'll explain the cold currents too in this slide, why we have a cold current here. And, um, uh, and the repti riptides are different. D um, are, the riptides are dangerous. So it's just, it's not a safe beach to swim at. Okay. I have a question. You got it. What's, what's um? Going? So does the accretionary wedge contribute to the coastline too from back when there was a subduction? 
zone or is that too old of a process that's an that it's older mostly it's mostly eroded or um good question actually because the you're thinking of the franciscan rocks i think the ones that are the cherts and the pillow basalts that are up in marin like that kind of accretionary wedge is that what you're talking about the abducted material I, or are you I talking guess. about a literal like wedge of sediments well i'm thinking about um i guess i'm thinking about the franciscan rock i don't know i was thinking that because of the scraping of the subduction back in you know yeah millions of years ago that that contributed to the coastlines but i don't know if that's too old of a process that it wouldn't have effect now it's not preserved everywhere and oftentimes um it, it, it's more frequent than people realize and, and people i mean geologists um subduction can be erosive so that like if you've got a subducting plate like this and hopefully my arms will show up on the screen and not you know so if this is your overriding continent and you've got a wedge of sediments here and you've got a subducting plate that's going down steeply um this wedge of sediments could actually be consumed by the subduction process and then oh, you'd okay. be left with nothing um or that it can be added to the edge of the continent, but you know it's also that type of material, unless it's lithified, it can weather and erode away pretty easily compared to other rocks. Um, the material that's abducted, like the Franciscan rocks, the cherts, and the pillow basalts, that that oceanic crust and and the ocean bottom sediments those were essentially scraped off off on the edge of the continent we call it obduction but it's still the same idea um, and those are preserved for in north of san francisco for quite a long ways south of san francisco not so much where is that material it's for the in, it's further inland is where it went do you know pacheco pass you guys know Pacheco no, Pass? Um, it, it, it's a kind of a dangerous section of road. I don't, is it Highway 52 maybe through Gilroy? You go right past the Gilroy Garlic Factory to get to, the, if you haven't driven down south on 101, like towards Monterey or something. <clears throat> um, do you guys drive? Yes, I've been yeah. to the Gilroy Garlic Factory. Yeah, oh, you have? I've never been inside. Yeah, just, same. No. No, don't go. <laughs> Lots of garlic. Lots of garlic. Yeah. It's there are hot. days, I swear to God, there are days like during the garlic festival time, you can smell it from a long ways away from here almost. I don't think you should go unless you like the heat because it's like. It is hot down there. It's too hot. Like I can I couldn't bear. I was so upset the whole time. Oh, no. Yeah, I hate it being too hot, too. Yeah, they hold it like in July or something. It's not a good time to be in Gilroy. <laughs> You're right. I don't think they're going to have it again because there was a shooting there. <gasps> You're right. Oh, that's right. That was a long time ago now. Yeah. And I haven't, they haven't had it for a while. All right, let's focus. I mean, <laughs> we're getting distracted. Pacheco Pass is where you go past the, gar gil gar blah, the Gilroy Garlic Factory that cuts over your like you're going to Yosemite if you're going east or you join Highway 5 to go south towards LA. That part right there is Pacheco Pass. That's where you would find um, rocks that are similar to the Ring Mountain rocks in Tiburon. Eclogites, blue schists, other material like Franciscan type material. So in that case, it's further inland that's because of the transform fault. Because right here, where we are, south of the, those Marin Franciscan rocks, I'm sitting on the Pacific plate. I'm not on the North American plate. North American plate is over there in like Crystal Springs Reservoir along Highway 280. And then it goes inland as you go like towards Salinas, 
towards Monterey, Salinas, down there. Um, it goes farther inland, quite a bit farther inland. Uh, if you go to Paso Robles, for example, those rocks are, the San Andreas Fault is still east of you from there. So it's, it's a fair ways inland. And that's where you would have to go if you wanted to see any material that was part of that subduction event, um, because that's the edge of the continent. Not, I mean, the edge of the, the plate when that subduction was happening, not here. Anyway, that's why you don't always, you don't always see, see, see things where you think you should see them because the landscape changes. Anyway, all right. <sighs> all right, so we're gonna talk about waves, how they move, how they carry energy, what they do like erode. erode. Um, we'll talk about wave behavior and what, it, what they do as they approach the shoreline. Um, I'm going to talk about different features of the shoreline. So there's a little bit of new ter terminology that we'll use just to describe those features. Um, we're going to talk about wave refraction and how that uh, contributes to longshore currents. Because if you've ever been swimming in the ocean and you got your towel on the beach somewhere <clears throat> and you're out in the water, and it's gotta be a pretty hot day to do this around here anyway, because the water's so cold. Um, over time, or maybe you're a surfer or a bodyboarder or something, um, over time, you're gonna drift. And here, you're gonna drift south a little ways. And you're gonna have to swim back or walk back up the beach to get to your towel because of the way that the waves come in, they end up pushing the water and any particles in the water, like sand, um, it's gonna be pushed south from here. That's this longshore current or and the longshore drift. Okay, um, we're gonna talk about, yeah, some features like spits and bay mouth bars. This has to do with how the sand is carried south along with that longshore drift. Uh, we'll look at, so I, we already started talking about submergent and emergent coast. We have an emergent coast. It's an active tectonic boundary and the coastline is actually uplifting out of the, the water above sea level over time. Whereas a submergent coastline is a low lying coast, kind of like North Carolina, Florida, those, those places in there on the passive margin where um, there's no tectonic activity moving things around. We're gonna look at, let's see. Yeah, okay. So I kept the language from the textbook here. This is concepts from the River of Sand movie. That, that's such a classic movie. I saw that. that. They showed that to me when I was in college and they probably showed it to 20 years of geology students before that. It's crazy. I looked at it again because I knew about it. I was like, oh yeah, the river of sand. And I went back and watched it. It's a great movie. I mean, it's oldish, but it's a great movie. And I hope you guys liked it. You know, for a documentary. I, I like documentaries because I'm a geek. Um, okay, the pattern of the ocean currents. We'll talk about ocean currents, surface currents and deep water circulation. Uh, I'm not gonna get into like climate because when you start talking about ocean currents that affects global climate because sea surface temperatures are warmed up with climate. So I'm, I'm gonna skip like talking about El Nino, La Nina and any like nutrients. I'm gonna save that for the biologists or the yeah, to explain those to you in a different class. We'll talk about tides too. Oh, we're in a king tide right now even. So um, it's either a new moon or a full moon right now. Does anybody know? Um, so because it's a new moon or a full moon, that means that the moon is either in line, the, the moon is in line with the sun. And so we have additional gravity pulling in a, in a certain 
direction on earth. And that pull, that's an extra bonus pull because the alignment of the gravity of the moon and the gravity of the sun pulling on earth, that means that our tides are especially, the high tides are especially high. Uh, so the, the ocean's a little dangerous right now. And in fact, there are a couple of rescues out here on Pacifica over the last few days because of the crazy surf. Okay, so we'll talk about those and how that, you know, what we've got out here. I'll show you how to read a, a tide table and like how to find tide information and just a little stuff about beach safety. And because those, all of those topics I think are so important because I want you to be safe when you go out onto the, to the coast. And I also want you to have a couple things in your back pocket to like impress somebody. You go to the coast and be like, hey, I can tell you how deep the water is right there. Or I know, I know why the waves are breaking. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You, you can brag to somebody. It's good trivia too. Okay, let's talk about some of the parts of the beach. <clears throat> um, dunes often form behind the, the active beach. So um, ab above the high tide mark. Um, that the high tide is kind of, or the tide is sort of in the, the foreshore region. Um, and there you've got the near, well, okay. So the near shore, the foreshore would be, would start with this, this little hill called a berm. So this is supposed to be a little hill of sand that piles up. And this looks like sort of a, a summertime beach with a lot of sand on the beach. In the winter time, that sand is removed. And if you watched a beach, the beach river of sand, you know that already, that the sand moves offshore and it comes off onshore during the summer. It's just moving back to these, these longshore bars during the winter. And then it gets, and that's because the, the wave energy is so much more during the winter, it erodes the, the sand off the beach, pulls it underwater, but the gentler waves during the summer, and it's gentler because we don't have storms out at sea. It's the storms out at sea that cause the big waves because this, they're, it's blowing the water. It's the wind action that's blowing on the water that gets the waves going. So if there are a lot of storms offshore or near shore, um, we'll have bigger waves. Okay that wave energy erodes the coast and it might expose sort of more rocks on the beach instead of sand. Uh, and the sand just goes offshore down here, like to one of these bars. And then, like I said, it gets redeposited with the gentle wave action. So the foreshore would incorporate this berm of sand, the little hill of sand that forms when it gets deposited during the summertime. There's a scarp, meaning there's like a little hill. You've got to go down a little cliff face or something on that berm and uh, then you're up in the dunes. Okay, uh, there is a trough that follows the shore. It just, the, it's called a longshore trough, that meaning think of longshore as being along the shore. The longshore trough is, there is a trough along the shore. So the water would get deeper. You would encounter one of these like longshore bars of sand and then, then on. Where the waves are shallow enough to break, you're also affecting the bottom of the sea, the sea bottom. So like you're getting ripples forming along the bottom of the, along the sand underneath the waves. In deeper water, the waves don't actually, the wave energy doesn't reach down to the bottom of the ocean, whether it's 10 feet down, a hundred feet down, 300 feet down, the wave energy is right up at the surface only. And you know, if you're if you swim in the ocean or if you're a surfer, you know that there's less energy underwater 
than where the waves are happening because you dive under the waves. Like if a wave is going to break on you, don't stand there and take it. You dive into the wave and under the wave to avoid the wave energy. And it's a lot, then you show up on the other side of the wave and boop, easy. So understanding where all of this action is happening will help you maybe be a better surfer. <laughs> so I found a bunch of different types of beach sand or cobbles, I suppose. Here's a nice, pretty well sorted, fairly well rounded, almost pure quartz sand. sand. Uh, this one happens to be from Australia. Uh, this one's Thailand. What do you notice about this? What's this? What are these little pieces that are long? Does anyone recognize what those pieces are? I'll give you a second. You don't you don't recognize those? Are they um like not limestone, but like maybe coccoliths and like other carbonate like shell type? Yeah. Things. Yeah. 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 There's shells. There's shell like little pieces of shells. This happens to be a coral. That's what I was after was coral. Um, so they're, they're probably pieces of shells and they're probably calcium carbonate shells and there's coral in here and coral is actually a living thing. It's yeah. When it dies though, <clears throat> it can wash ashore and become part of the, the sediment. Same thing here, there are more shells and this is like a slightly more eroded, um, a grain with a spiral pattern. It looks like it rolled around and accumulated layers of calcium carbonate. So more shells and coral here. Here's a uh, obsidian beach. This happens to be in Hawaii. Um, is it really obsidian or is it just kind of glassy basalt? I bet it's just glassy basalt and they're cheating and calling it obsidian. This is, this looks probably like um, that green sand beach that's at the southern tip of Hawaii, which happens to be the southern tip of the United States completely. Um, if you wanna go as far south as you can in the United States, you go to the south end of the big island near the green sand beach. And why is it green? What's this mineral? Olivine? Yeah, it's olivine. What's the black stuff? Go ahead, Kay. Maybe, maybe hornblende or biotite? Oh, it says obsidian. It says right there. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's actually obsidian, actually. I think that it's basaltic rock. I mean, it might be, again, kind of glassy basaltic rock, but it's still basalt. That's what I was trying to say. I guess it does say that right there. I should have covered that up. <laughs> and the white stuff, shells or coral, again, it's a tropical environment. And so in the tropics, you expect to find corals and calcium carbonate shells. So that's what that is. I've never seen this one before. This is said to be a, um, a garnet beach, which is totally cool. I stuck that in there, even though it looks like blood, it's kind of weird, but garnet. And you know you don't always have sand-sized particles. Sometimes you have rocky beaches, right? It depends on what's going on in terms of the geology near, right at the beach, and it depends what you've got going on just offshore. And there's some exchange right at the beach, so you might get coral and shells coming up from the under below the water and rocks coming off from uh, offshore. Okay. How do waves move? Okay, look at the seagull. Uh, this circle right there indicates like how a particle of water would rotate. So the seagull stays where it is and the wave particle moves sort of in a circle underneath. So the, the seagull just moving up and down with the wave and the particles are rolling and rotating like this. So the water is moving and rotating and moving toward the coast, but 
the like a single particle on the surface like a duck or a seagull or whatever would just like bob up and down in the same place the particle path changes a little bit underwater it becomes more oval shaped until and it, and it gets smaller because there's less wave energy the deeper you go down like i was explaining and then at this point it's saying basically there's no wave energy left okay um some definitions of the waves itself this is the crest of a wave the the peak it's it's crest where the high point this is its trough so the low point in the wave and the distance from peak to peak or trough to trough is called one wavelength and knowing what what one wavelength is is helpful because it's something you can measure and something that you can measure with a satellite image off Google Earth, or you can go down to the beach and just estimate distance uh, looking at the rows of waves, just looking where the crest to crest, like what distance is that. That's That tells you something because by the time that the wave starts to crest and actually become, get in the surf zone, because until like they're just rolling, like this is bobbing around, the water's moving towards the coast, the, the particles are rotating underneath these waves. And what happens when you get here? The wave actually, it gets shallow enough, the water gets shallow enough that the bottom of the wave starts to feel the seabed. It starts to feel bottom or there's another term for it. I found, anyway, when it starts to feel, it starts to slow down at the base of the wave and the top of the wave is still moving faster. So if you slow the base of the wave down and the top of the wave is still going at the same speed, it's moving beyond the base. So it's gonna start to roll over and crest. That happens where the water depth is half of one wavelength. So let's say here to here is 20 meters, 60 feet. Sure, that sounds reasonable. 20 meters from crest to crest. It would be at 10 meters water depth where the waves start to feel bottom and they start to crest. They start to just like they're about to move over. Like the closer you get to the coast, the the more it will bend over the top because the, the faster the top is going, the slower the bottom is going. Okay. So I, I said at the beginning, I started, I said that there's storms offshore and there's a lot of wind in the storms. It's that wind that generates a bunch of waves. So at first, it's it sends out these what are called it's called swell it sends out these gravity waves it looks like this they're fairly like large you know widely spaced there's a boat for scale so they're pretty big in between the wavelength from crest to crest is pretty big maybe not 20 meters in that case maybe 10 meters 30 feet um and there's this kind of wave, a capillary. This is just a ripple, right? This really isn't like a, a gravity wave that's actually going to travel through the whole ocean. So this is more of a local type um, where the waves are starting out, these small ripples. And then they get larger and they're speeding up as they they travel through the ocean. Okay, so a couple different kinds of waves. The capillary waves are these little ripples. The gravity waves are the ones that are basically the, those wind generated waves from storms that come at us from various directions, but they're all, they're all offshore somewhere. And they, those waves are coming at us. They might be coming at us from two different directions. Um, but when they do, the waves start to rotate towards the coast. Oh, 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 sorry, wrong button I touched. Um, oh yeah, okay, so 
when they, these are these body waves, these, um, the swell that we, we, I was talking about. So the big waves that are generated, they're, they're moving towards the coast. And as they get towards the coast, as the water gets shallower, the waves get larger. So the height of the wave, the amplitude of the wave gets higher and higher until the time at which it breaks when it gets to that that shallow depth that's half one wavelength so there's one wavelength right half of that is the depth we're talking about here where they start to feel bottom and break that's the surf zone okay um what else do i want to mention here i said these things already this is this diagram is showing you that it's feeling the it's feeling the bottom it's slowing down at the base here and it's going to start to tip over okay where are we this shows it better okay so here's the direction of the waves we've got a constant so out in the open ocean in the deep water it's a constant wavelength um and that's because it's not feeling bottom at all. But when it comes to when those waves reach shore, and we're only talking about the top part of the water body or the top part of the ocean, the bottom of the, like the, at some depth, it's not, the waves aren't affecting the water at all. It's just this top part. And when the water gets shallow enough, and feels bottom, then wave height starts to increase. The wavelength shortens. So the waves get closer together when they come close to shore. You can probably, well, we don't need to go, we can probably measure it on something like this, but the angle is not quite right. But you should be able to see the wavelength getting shorter towards shore and it should be the same distance out here uh we were here i think yeah so the wavelength increases sorry the yeah the wavelength shortens the wave height increases and the top of the wave is moving faster than the bottom of the wave indicated here and it starts to roll over the top and this shows exactly what i was talking about there's one wavelength and then right here this is half a wavelength so the same distance is here to here is here to here. Um, that's where it touches bottom and it starts to slow down, starts to crest. The wave actually doesn't crest, meaning it doesn't actually roll over until you get to about one third the water depth of the wavelength. So a little bit shallower. It just slow down here, crests here. Uh, also, yeah, and then within that zone too, after the wave starts to feel bottom, that's when you start to have ripples generated along the seafloor. Otherwise, it doesn't touch the bottom. It doesn't, the bottom doesn't feel it at all, the wave at all. And so it's unaffected. I realize it's just after 12. Let me just say a few more things and then I'll let you go because we got such a, I talked about the labs for so long. Um, just do me that favor, please. And so that we can finish these on Thursday. Okay. The waves are coming, the waves are coming out in from the storm. So let's, there's some, some storm out here. The waves are being generated. They're coming in this direction. When they start to reach the shore and when they start to feel bottom, they not only slow down, but they start to refract, they bend, and the wave starts to get more parallel to the shoreline. So instead of being at an angle like this, the wave is at an angle like this when it's closer. You can really see the refraction in this image here where here's some waves coming in and there are features in here, they must be striking. Like they're definitely refracting around this little rocky island. They're coming in and then there's some waves coming through here that are bending around these, the point and this island. And then waves are bending here between this little rocky point or island and whatever's out here. And then you see an interference pattern here. 
but check it out. The waves look like this. They're at a high angle to the beach, but when you actually get into the beach, they're almost parallel to the beach, right? They're still at a little bit of an angle though. Here, I think I can, let me just zoom in so you can see that really well. So right here, the angle of the wave is like this to the coastline. I would say the coastline's like this, the angle's like this, the wave's like this. But when you get down here, there's a wave. It's at a very small angle to the beach, much, and so it just gets progressively smaller. So that's what happens when you're at the beach. The waves are mostly coming in parallel, but they're at a little bit of an angle. This is where the river of sand idea comes in. And this is where longshore current starts to um, play a role. This is just another diagram showing you how if a wave is coming into a bay or a wave is coming into a rocky prom, like a point sticking out, you'll see the if it comes straight at the rocky point, it's not affected. If it's at a slight angle, the waves are bending around it. And so you get a wave pattern that looks like this. Okay. <clears throat> um, right. The one thing I last thing I'll mention here is when you see the incoming wave direction, that angle will tell you which way the longshore current is moving because it the longshore current is moving in that acute angle that's formed between the incoming wave and the shoreline and so the direction of motion of the sand in the in the sh the surf zone and in the longshore current is going to be down here and what happens is an individual particle and what you saw in that video when they they put a red stain in the water or was it yellow? I can't remember exactly. I think it was one of those colors. Um, they put a stain in the water and you could see that the water moved along the shoreline, but an individual particle moves up with the wave, you know, like in the, the, the swash when the waves are moving back and forth, moves up the beach and back down the beach up the beach, back down the beach. But it's coming in at an angle here and then going out straight out, angle straight out, angle straight out. So over time, that particle has moved from there to here. And it follows that longshore current direction or it follows the, the direction of longshore drift. Okay. So same thing, here's the beach. They're not, not much of, in terms of waves coming in here, but there's a little wave. It's mostly parallel to the beach. Um, but here, what you would get the same pattern. It's incoming this way, it's at a small angle, right? So longshore current is this direction to the right. The particles are moving like this, in at an angle, out straight, in at an angle, out straight. And that's just, you know, with the tide and with that, that the waves in the swash. That longshore current, um, wave energy erodes beaches and sand's valuable. It's valuable for construction. Sand is a, in fact like the, in, sand and gravel are like the largest sort of material that's used to build stuff because you need sand and gravel to, for bases of roads and um, foundations of buildings to just put a level surface to start with. Um, and you like them at beaches, like the sand should stay at the beach, right? You need beaches, or at least beaches are nicer than no beach. Um, but you can have a lot of erosion. And so some people, it's been tried to build these things called groins that stick out into the water. And the idea of the groin is to capture sand that's traveling in the longshore current direction. Can you tell me which direction the longshore current is moving in this image? Oops, ah, I didn't mean to do that. Does anyone want to take a guess? Let me identify the waves for you. 
Okay, so the waves are coming in like this, here, here, and they're refracting like this. And then you see the surf here. So it, there's a very small angle. Here's the beach and the waves are coming in at a small angle. Which way is longshore drift moving the sand? To the left. To the left, thank you, yes, to the left. So within that angle here and the beach down that way. It's not, otherwise it would be the large angle or the obtuse angle. It's not going that way, it's going that way. Okay, the effect of the groin is to capture some of the sand moving in the longshore current. And so it builds up on the up current direction of the groins and it builds up, it'll build up the beach. <clears throat> Um, the problem is it'll also erode on the downside of the groin. So if you notice, it's building up on the right side of the groin, but it's eroded on the left side of the groin. So there's an erosive action going here uh, and it's being deposited here. But over time, that sand's gonna build up, go around the groin, build up. You might get erosion all the way back to this to all this development and that's not good. What they're trying to do is keep the beach. But when you alter the natural state, that's not good. It could be that there was an insufficient supply of sand naturally because there was mining somewhere or because somebody else built something like a giant pier that was capturing too much sand and it deprived this area of sand. So local communities will decide to do things like this in order to keep the sand. What else do I wanna say about this? Maybe nothing else. Okay, just a couple more minutes. Let's do the riptides. Okay. So this is, it, you know, this almost, this could be our beach right here, but it's not, it's, this is Chile. Chile looks a lot like California similar kind of latitude, similar kind of geology too. Okay, so the, the waves are coming in. Um, the arrows, do you notice the difference at the points along the, in the surf zone where those arrows are? Look at the surf, look at where the waves are breaking and then look at where the arrows are pointing. What do you see that's different? And you can just describe it. Um, I can tell you that right here, I see there's a wave breaking here. There's a lot of white water, another wave breaking here, white water, wave breaking, and then it's the surf zone. I but noticed I think, there's a little gap in the white water. Yeah, exactly. There's a little gap in the white water. Same here. You see that gap in the white water? where the, there's no wave breaking right there, is it? There's no wave breaking here, no wave breaking here. It's just like a gap in the waves. That's your rip current, that's your rip tide. So what's happening is this diagram is like turned around the wrong way, but here's the incoming wave and they're breaking, breaking, breaking. And there's a return, like it's bringing a material, and, but the waves, come back out afterwards, right? They come in, they wash in and they wash out. And so there's some circulation happening. They wash in and they wash out. So this is kind of like the where the water is washing back out to the ocean. So it's coming in here and like making a U-turn and coming back out. It's coming in, well, coming out. So it's probably rotating like this and rotating like that. So, where the waves wash out, these rip currents form. And the reason that they can be so dangerous is that they pull pretty strongly in places like Ocean Beach, I was telling you, there are warning signs about the rip currents. Anywhere you see a warning sign about a rip current, unless you're an experienced ocean swimmer or surfer, uh, don't mess around with the rip currents. If you're playing in the water, maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody else that's playing in the water 
and you get sucked out by one of these rip currents. If, if you like, let's say you're playing in the surf here, you think you're safe and it's cool, but then a wave, like you're not looking and a wave takes you out and you tumble in the water. And then like you're washed around, you don't know where you are. You could get caught up in a rip current if you're not, if you're too close to it and you would get pulled out and you might get pulled out underwater very quickly. This is what you do, hold your breath and hold your breath as long as if you're underwater, hold your breath. If you come up, get some air, but like if you're underwater, hold your breath and ride it out. You ride the current out until it stops pulling you. Or as soon as, soon as you have the ability, swim away from it. You swim this direction or you swim that direction to get out of it because it could continue. Like it may pull out for a very long ways, like hundreds of feet. So if you can make it to here and swim out of it, get out of the rip current, then you can like get your air, capture it, like your heart's probably racing, you're scared, like just calm down and then you can swim back in here. But that's how you survive those is to just ride it. You don't struggle. You don't try to swim back to shore because you're just going to wear yourself out. So ride it, hold your breath, come up for air, swim out of the current. Questions about that? Hopefully you can see this. So next time you go to the beach here around California, see if you can spot the rip currents. It's an important thing. Here's an, uh, I had another one here. So this is, this is Ocean Beach, right? A little video. This is like the warning sign that you might see. And what it tells you is just like this. Here's the rip current and it has these arrows that say escape. So you wanna swim to the side, away, to the right, to the left, not back towards shore. Don't fight it, swim out of it and to shore. Um, if you can't escape it, try to float and tread water at least. Like get to, get air and try to stay, keep your head above the water. And oh, the universal sign for help when you're in the water is to wave both arms. If you get caught and you're out there stuck and you don't have the energy, you just wave both arms and someone at the shore will see you and send help. Okay, here's a rip current. So waves coming in normally right there. Do you, you can see the water flowing out in like a little river almost. Okay, so it's coming in, cycling back out. And that looks like a pretty strong rip current, frankly, if that you can actually see it. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I didn't wanna scare you. I didn't want you to stay out of the water completely here. I'm just saying, watch out. And if you go into the water, identify where the rip currents are and don't swim there, that's all I'm saying. Um, so hopefully that is something that you learn. You learn a little bit about how waves, like when and why waves break, um, what the rip currents look like and what you call the drift, that longshore drift that happens when these waves come in at an angle to the beach, to the coast. Okay, so on Thursday, I'll tell you about those marine terraces that we have in the hills. I'll show you what they look like, what the old ones look like. Um, and we'll get to some ocean circulation stuff too and tides. Okay, so unless you have questions, I'm gonna hang out here for a little bit longer. If you have questions about your labs or whatever, hang out, ask me. Otherwise, I'll see you Thursday and good luck studying for the exam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, bye. Th thank you, Mary. You're welcome. I do have a question about the uh, lab. Which one? Lab A, because um, 
um, I saw my grade and I got a zero. Did I leave you a note? Yeah, because uh, you said that it was, um, I left out like two rows. Oh, the formatting. Yeah. So you need to reformat and send that to me again. Is it okay if I like show you like um, which um, so that I, I need um, you to submit it so that I can grade it. I know, but like, um, which, which two rows was it? Because, um, the end, did you look at your, did you look at the PDF you, you submitted? You can see hmm. here, I'll go, I'll open it for you. Um, when you saved it as a PDF, you probably should have checked what the file looked like before you uploaded. Cause that can happen. A lot of that happened to a lot of people, this lab actually. Um, well, I think what happened is your Word document got reformatted somehow, and it was like a, a portrait instead of a landscape format. And then when you saved that as the PDF, it just cut off that bit. Hang on. Web's being a little slow. Okay, let me out. And let's go to eight is here submit seven eight okay and let's see I'm just looking for yours and then I'll share the screen. Here we go, I found you. Okay, let me stop this. Let me start sharing this. Oh, wrong one. Sorry, 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 hang on. It's okay. This one here. Okay, where'd you go there? Wait. Wait, isn't this is, oh, it's the wrong lab. This is nine, sorry. Again, we gotta go back. Okay. Lab, I thought I clicked that one, lab eight. And then, okay, here. You must be on the very last page, of course. There you are. Okay, so um, sorry, it's popping up another one. I'm gonna get that ready and then show you what I'm talking about. But I gotta scroll down here to the right part. Okay, let me switch this and share this. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. So you've got most of it, but the ends cut off. And that's true for all the pages. See how you're missing? You're missing like two rows. Oh yeah, so it's like the sample number and kit for that for that one, and then that one's missing the sample number from your kit, and then protolith. Wait, wrong one. That's eight. Protolith. Oh, I guess I guess I could see the the metamorphic ones, but I couldn't see the igneous ones. So I wanted you to just submit it, resubmit it with everything, and then I'll I'll give you the grade. Okay. Yeah, got it. So just uh, so, fix the. Uh, or just send, you don't. If you just send me the word document, and I can work. I can fix it. it. The problem was when you converted it to the PDF. I couldn't do anything. And you should be able, you should be able to upload another document, but 
Yeah, I think so. It's, it says unlimited, so you should be able to upload. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Do you want do you want to just drop it there now, or do you need to go find it and stuff? No, I ha I have it already like up right here. I just um like working like on how to like um make sure that like every row is like um. Yeah, like I, I totally know how I can do it very quickly if you just want to give me the Word document. I'll like share it, share it with you. No, it's on I'll upload it to iLearn for lab eight. Well, uh, cause it's not on a Word doc, it's on Google Docs. Save it as a Word doc. Okay. I, I will save it as a Word it doc. It should, I mean, check it. You need to check it to make sure that the content is there. Um, or or you can do the share thing and you can like, you can maybe, can you reply to this in iLearn? And maybe you can just share the link with the file there. Something like that. Uh, I can, yeah, I, I can try and see. One of those ways, yeah. So I'll sh share the link. Yeah, if you save it as a Word doc, that should be fine. Um, I should be able to get it. It's also got, a, you can, it also has an option to email it. So you could also just send the email from Google Docs. That's cool. That saves you having to open up email and all that. What happens if you share? So if you share, copy the I think that should work, no problem. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, like I said in my note to you, I, I, I gave you the zero only to catch your attention so that you would submit the revised lab. Um, but I'm not gonna like take points um, for this. Submitted the, so I submitted it in the Word doc. Oh, great, okay. So let me refresh my screen. Ah, I see it, super. I will tell you right now if I can see everything. Okay, so it's still cut off, but I'm gonna change this to landscape and it should correct itself. Uh-oh. Ooh, it is not there. Okay, so it looks like, wait, wait, is it there? Maybe it is. Oh my God. This change, it wants, it's making me change each page. Okay, it's there. Oh, did you not have the rock kit? I do have the rock kit, yeah. There are no, numbers in that column did you well, mean to have numbers in that column well because um i didn't um see it on the uh apple kit before it just showed up to me like how um you saw it before so what how how, how i presented to you like on how how i submitted it to you yeah that's how that's how um 
it worked that's how i worked on it because i never saw like the sample kit number oh you didn't see this column i never saw the column <laughs> oh okay well would you like to add numbers to that before you before i grade it because yeah. um that's the that's like 10 points so i would add those numbers if i were you okay why don't i i'll let you do that and just upload another one same as before with the the word doc and it'll be fine okay um on lab seven you did say that um in one of your notes you did say that halit was in my um kit the highlight yeah yeah it's 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 not in my kit so do you have a missing mineral or oh. what no, no, all the minerals are there. It's just um, halit, halit, or it's just not halite, one of them. Halite. Halite's just not one of them. It should be number 11. Uh, You're looking at your mineral kit, not your rock kit, right? Correct. Okay. See. Mine is a very a small piece like this. It's got very square no. edges. And it says my number eleven is pyrolus pyrolusite. Pyrolusite. Oh, so you didn't get the same kit. That's the problem. Oh, I got this one. I don't see this one. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so that's not the same. All right, fine, that's fine in this case. Could you put just a note that there's no halite? And I'll remember that we talked about it. Yeah, it says, yeah, it says um, in the lab that it's not in kit. Okay, thank you for telling me that. Now I know. I'll, I'll just i'll finish the sample number in kit and then it's okay if i submitted it again sure. like in 10 minutes yeah no problem i'll go back and look for it in in a half an hour or something okay all right thank you mm -hmm. all right sure see ya see ya bye